Hey everyone, hi and welcome to the Real with Shy Power Pack series where I bring to you 50 amazing business experts. Today I have with me orchestra conductor, leadership consultant, and the founder of the music paradigm, Mr. Roger Nirenberg. Please help me welcome Mr. Nirenberg. Hi, Charles. How are you, Mr. Nirenberg? Delighted to be here. Wonderful. Okay, tell us who is Roger Nirenberg and give us a little bit about your backstory. Well, Roger Nirenberg is an orchestra conductor for the first, oh, I'd say 25 years of my career. Um, that was pretty much what I did, rehearsals, concerts, uh, music director of two orchestras and guest conducting many other orchestras. But at a certain point, I got interested in the in thinking about the human dynamics of what's going on on my stage, especially the relationship between the conductor and the orchestra. And I began to wonder whether the things that I had learned could be applicable to other kinds of organizations and especially to other other leaders in their positions. And I began to discover that when you use the orchestra as a laboratory for exploring the people issues in organizations, they became amazingly alive and crystal clear. They snapped into focus. Um, and then I invented this uh, this kind of learning experience, which I've called the music paradigm. And um, and when I started doing it, I got this amazing feedback, not only about how revelatory it was, but that it was had huge business value. And lo and behold, I started getting invitations from business organizations all around the world. And so that's what I do now. Wow, that's amazing. So tell us, first of all, what got you started in music? Well, uh, it's a little hard to describe. I mean, you hear something in music, or let me put it in the first person. I heard something in classical music. I heard something that was so amazingly beautiful and big and real and compelling that I knew I was about nine years old. I knew that that was what my life was going to be about. There was just no question about it. Wonderful. And tell us a little about your education, the music paradigm. Well, I started studying with a composer privately when I was still in junior high school because I wanted to be a composer. <laughs> and uh, so I had those lessons. And then uh, when I graduated from high school, I went to Princeton University where I studied music composition. And then I went, uh, did a, a postgraduate diploma at the Manus College of Music. After that, I taught for a number of years at Queens College on the faculty. But then I entered the uh, conducting program at the Juilliard School. And after that, I began my career. And I would say that, you know, I've learned uh, much, much more after my education than during it. But th that was my formal education. Wow, I mean, with formal education like that, I mean, Julia at Princeton, wow, that that must have been an amazing experience to have attended these schools, and you say that you learn after. Uh, why would you say that? Well, I think I think that when I, when I had the education, uh, when I look back on it all the time, I think about how I was not yet ready to really absorb what the institutions had to had to offer me. I think when I went to Juilliard, I was already an adult, so I, I did much better there. But I look back on the things that I learned when I was in college, and I think about how much more I could have learned if I had been more ready for it. You're right. So you have found a way to tie music and leadership and growing organizations. Now, we know a lot of parents tend to think of music as just, if their child studies it, they want to be just a musician. And you have found a way to do so much more with that. So tell us a little about that. How were you able to do that? 
Well, um, I think it was a, a very natural and kind of inevitable thing for me. But, you know, music, when you come right down to it, it's life. It's, it's breathing. It's, it's a heartbeat. It, it, it kind of has the essentials of life. And if you understand music and the skills of being a musician, you begin to see that they're the very same skills that we use all the time in life, especially in relating to people. I mean, the skill of listening, the skill of being present, the skill of being flexible, the skill of valuing the, the ensemble of what a number of people are doing more than each individual contribution, but looking at the way people, people influence each other. All that is music making. Fundamentally, it's music. It's the same thing. But the thing is, when you hear musicians do it, it's very, very clear. It's crystal clear. In life, it's more complicated because life unfolds at a much slower pace than music does. And therefore, it's harder to connect the dots in our own life than it is if we see our life represented in a way in a musical uh in a musical context, and that's what I do. I use the orchestra, a live orchestra, as a kind of laboratory, and we try on different behaviors. And when you try it on with an orchestra, you hear the result immediately. So in life, you know, you might, you might misbehave in a certain way. You might, for example, get distracted and, and not be listening. Or you might, while well, somebody else is talking, you might be thinking only about what you're going to say and not really, not really connecting with them at all. And you won't know that. Maybe you will never find it out or you won't know it much later. But in music, if you start doing that, you start hearing that it goes out of tune right away. So, so therefore, if you can, if you can represent uh, these interactions uh, in an orchestra, you can reveal incredible truths. Uh, so that just came to me. It was very clear to me. And then all I had to do was put it in motion. That is amazing. So traditionally, people have connected music and psychology, more so with being able to focus and increasing IQ and being able to complete tasks at a better rate. So what do you think about that? What is the connection between music and psychology? Well, I think to be a musician, you know, it starts with your childhood. First challenge is to, is to, is to confront your impatience because it requires a lot of patience and children don't have patience. But some children have the ability to focus and they have the ability to take directions and they have the ability to... to to work on things, follow their curiosity. And so, and the many skills uh, involved in music, long range planning, breaking, breaking complex problems down into smaller problems and solving them systematically. And then having the faith to believe that if you continue to work at something with patience and systematically, eventually that problem will will solve. You'll be able to find a way to solve that problem. But in our culture, what we're taught, quite the contrary, is instant gratification. If you can't get instant gratification, move on to something else. You know, find something else that you're better at. Well, that's not the way you think as a musician. You think about changing yourself. And therefore, somebody who, who, has, who has that, the, that set of skills that, that approach to life has already a big advantage. That is powerful. So since we're on the subject of instant gratification, let's, let's talk about setting goals. 2019 is the beginning of the year. How do we set goals? How do we set a vision? Yeah, well, you're asking a really good question, a very powerful question there. Of course, everybody has to set the goal that is right for them. And the thing is, it, it can be confusing because you get a lot of messages from all over the place about what, uh, what you think other people think your goal should be. 
And if you, you're the kind of person who, who focuses primarily on pleasing other people, uh, it's going to be very it's going to be very confusing to find your own goal. So I think the first thing is you have to find your own voice. You have to find your own identity. You have to find the things that you really believe in. And if that's not clear to you, then I think you have to think back to, you know, what were the moments when you felt most alive, when you felt most inspired, when you felt most right about about yourself and what was going on then. And what does that imply about who you are and what you should be doing? But let's assume that you do know yourself to that extent. Then I think you have, uh, have to consider what kind, of, what kind of future, in what way, would you, do you believe in is worth working for? And then, you know, it's a, it's a, a, a fascinating calibration to figure out what is within the range of possibility and what is just, you know, just fantasy. For example, if my goal is to become an NBA basketball player, that, that's a fantasy for me because I'm not tall enough for that. So you, you, have to, you have to stay within the realm of possibility and you can't set a goal which is too great a leap from you. And then you have to also, I think, set intermediary goals so that you can, as, as you move forward, you can uh, create a menu of successes for yourself. That's very important that, that as, as you work towards achieving a goal, you have to have points where you have achieved something. And if you don't have those interme intermediary points, it's just too demoralizing. So you have to manage for yourself exactly how you're going to pursue it. Wow, that's powerful. That is powerful. Definitely. So let's talk about becoming an engaging leader. Since we're talking about goals and visions and embracing our true self, our true purpose, let's talk about being an engaging leader. Let's say I have set my goals. They're realistic. It's not a fantasy. How do I step into leadership? Hmm. Well, once again, you're asking a really interesting question. Um, I think there are many ways of stepping into leadership. So let's just start with the least expected way. How do I step into leadership when I don't necessarily have any authority? Because that's the one that people don't think about. They think leadership is when you have authority. Yeah. But let's talk about when you don't have any authority. And if I may, I'd like to, to recount this kind of parable that a business consultant once told me about this man who's at an airport and he's stuck. And, and, and you know, it's one of these situations where people are waiting at the gate for hour after hour after hour and everybody's in a terrible mood. They don't know if the plane will fly and when it will fly and they have nothing to do. You, you know, we've all been in that situation. And uh, one guy in the uh, amongst the, amongst the throng that are there disappears and comes back comes back 15 minutes later with 48 long stem roses, and he starts saying to people, you know, if we, you think we're upset, my wife is waiting for us at, at the airport. We we're supposed to arrive, and she's stuck there too, just the way we are. And this is our anniversary, and we were supposed to be together. So. I bought these roses. Would you take one of them? And when you get off the plane, would you hand it to my wife and wish her happy anniversary? And so he starts passing these around and people are holding these roses. They start talking to each other. They start talking about their families and about how they proposed to their spouses and things like that. And the whole atmosphere in, in the gate changes so that when they finally announce that they're boarding the plane, people have been distracted for a while. They, they arrive at the destination, and one by one, they're getting off the plane. They're finding his wife. They're giving her the roses, but they're not going to the place that they were in a such a hurry to get to. They're waiting around because they want to see him deliver the 48th rose to her. And they're in this huge circle around her. When he comes off and gives it to her, they're all applauding, and that's leadership. And it doesn't take any authority. Which, which means that everybody has the, the, the power and the ability to take the situation which, they're, which is handed to them 
and to transform it and to transform it in the direction of the things that they believe in the most that makes life most worth worthwhile living. So first of all, it's really important to recognize that, that you can bring that you can bring energy, you can bring joy, you can bring, you know, meaning to every situation that, that you're in. But let's talk about the more conventional idea about, about leadership, which is uh, when you have a, a position. So I think you have to do a lot of contemplation about, well, what good, what's the good here? What can be accomplished? What's worth accomplishing? So you assess the, the talent that, that you're leading. You assess what, what are they really good at, especially the strengths. And then you look at, the, at the, the environment and what's being asked and what might you accomplish. And then you sort of draw up a, a plan. And I find that a lot of leaders are, um, they don't, they underinvest in this kind of imaginary work. And maybe it's because I was trained as a composer from, you know, from so young that I think in the imagination a lot. And I think, what if? But I think this is really important because if you don't have an answer to what if, it's going to be very difficult to be a compelling leader. It's going to be very difficult to be engaging because you're not actually engaged yourself. So the powerful thing is to find the thing that you believe in that you think is the right plan uh, so that when you address your people, when you communicate it, however it is that you're going to do, you are filled with that energy and you have that kind of vision of this is our future. I can, I can see it. I can feel it. Uh, and then you talk about these things and you talk about only the things that really matter to you. Because if you start talking about things that because you think you're supposed to do it, you're never going to have that authenticity. You're never going to be able to engage people, to enroll them, to get them to give what they can give to something that's your idea. I mean, people will obey leaders as a kind of negotiation with themselves that they, they figure they get more by going along with the leader than by resisting the leader. But that's not the same thing as really uh, feeling that there's something for you in this and that the things you believe in are part of this program that your leader is, is uh, outlining for you. So that's a, a quite a long answer to the question you, you asked, but you asked such a provocative question. No, no, that, that was beautiful. Thank you. That, that was beautiful. So informative. Thank you such wisdom on that subject. So let's, since we're talking about thinking, let's look at strategic thinking. Okay. That's a favorite of mine. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about strategic thinking. What What is strategic thinking or how can one be a strategic thinker? Well, of course, one could wish that you had all the power in the world. You had all the money that you needed. You had all the time. You had all the talent. And then, you know, you could get something done. But that's fantasy. Reality is that you have limited resources. You always have limited resources. And it doesn't matter where you are in your life, you know, uh, how much money you have or whatever. There's always a limit to your resources. So, when you assess what it is that you're trying to do and then you assess the resources, the many different resources that you have, you have to figure out, well, how am I going to apportion these resources in such a way? How am I going to mobilize them? And then how am I going to plan? How am I going to deploy them? And a lot of it has to do with the order in which you do things, because if you do things in the wrong order, they may not be powerful. They have to be done in the right order. So it has a lot to do with, with clarity, clarity about goal, clarity about, about resources, and then de developing a kind of a plan. Now, the fact that you have the plan doesn't mean that that's necessarily the way things are going to go. And 
you don't need a plan which is absolutely refined in such a way, so perfect that it's not going to fail. There's always a, a kind of experimentation. You, you, you deploy your plan and you start watching the results and you start assessing the results and you start learning from, from what happens. And then you're constantly revising the plan to and refine it to, to figure out how it can be more effective. And I think all of that comes under the, the, the category of strategic planning. I agree. So what would you say is the real power behind becoming a strategic thinker? What is the power behind it? Why should I become a strategic thinker? Well, one should become a strategic thinker because it's a lot more fun to succeed than it is to fail. Um, Failure is frustrating. It's demoralizing. I mean, it has great opportunities for learning. So failure is not a total failure. Uh, but when you, when you plan something and you work towards it and, and, and you get results, that's very energizing. That it, it's very fortifying. It, it gives you ambition to, to do, now do something else. So, and if you, if you just see what's in front of you and decide, well, I'll do this, and you see the next thing in front of you, do that, there, there's not the kind of power that comes from a cohesion, co cohesive plan, which is carried out in the right order, because it just has a much greater chance of having success. You don't have to go back and retrace and, and, and start again and, and you know, waste time and and waste resources. So that's why I think strategic planning is so important. And if you're a leader, you know, not only are you creating frustration for yourself, but you're creating frustration for your people. And then you start having tension with your people because they're losing confidence in the fact that if they follow your directions, that, that will be a good thing for them. They may be learning that following your directions is going to be bad. So all that is part of part of strategic thinking. Wow, you're just rolling into my next question. <laughs> so how do we foster genius teams? I know this is one of your areas of expertise. Yeah. How do we foster genius teams? Yeah, I just want to point out something, if I may, before I answer that question. The fact, the fact that what I'm saying is kind of leading you into your next thing, that's a kind of a musical thing. That means like our minds are kind of beginning to flow in, mm -hmm. in an idea, the same way that a phrase flows. Because I look at the world and I see music everywhere. And that's part of, the, that's part of what I've learned to mobilize to help people to, to understand themselves and their own power. So let me be, get back to your question. The question is, how do you create genius teams? Yes. Well, I think, first of all, you throw away the, 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 the label, genius teams, because that's very intimidating. Um, geniuses don't come along that, that often, and everybody doesn't have to be a genius, and you don't have to have genius solutions in order to have extremely effective solutions. So I get intimidated when I hear, hear the word genius. On the other hand, if I think that there is genius in everybody, and what I like to think about is when people dream, and everybody dreams, everybody has dreams, and in their dreams, they have these fantastic, colorful, emotional experiences, artistic experiences. Everybody becomes an artist in their dreams. You know, a, a, a movie maker, an author. Uh, so inside of everybody, there is a kind of special capacity. And... And I think it's important to realize that. But I think people get, get misled by the notion that in order to have a, a so-called genius team, you have to have geniuses or you have to be a genius yourself. You don't have to be a genius. What you want is a genius team. And the genius team is genius because of the way that they work together. And anybody can do that. But we know that our default is not necessarily to, to work with people in the best way because of the things that I was talking about 
when I was talking about learning a musical instrument, because we get distracted, because we we get we get focused on our own issues, our own problems, our own our own daydreaming or something. We don't really pay attention, and we don't we don't necessarily really connect with the people that we're working in such a way that we get energized by that connection. So a genius team is for me is one where the people are are feeling energized by the, the fact they're being heard, they're being understood, they're connecting, they work in unison, they start to finish each other's sentences because they're, they're thinking along the same way. And and people are contributing. And that's what you aspire to. You know, when I was a young conductor, if I was frustrated with what, what an orchestra was doing, I used to think, well, I need to change the orchestra. I need to change this player. I need to, you know, have a better, a better orchestra in order to achieve what I was doing. But I don't think that way at all. It's, it's, it's more that you, the way the people work and how you can get them to, to realize uh, their potential just through through the people that you have. I think wanting better people to a certain extent is a cop out. You say if I only had better people, then I'd be able to do this or that. And a lot of times that's not true because you have other people and then you discover that the issues were not people issues, they were systemic issues that anybody in that position would be exhibiting that behavior because it's it's what the, the system that's created is driving people towards. And it's really important to be able to differentiate between what is it just a personnel thing and what is a systemic thing. And that's part of, of creating a good team also. There's a lot that goes into being a good leader. Yeah, wow. So you're saying to um, build my team, I should be focused on system as opposed to picking and choosing who I want to be on my team. Well, of course, it's great when you can pick and choose. That's that's great. And sometimes you can do that. But a lot of times you're not starting from scratch. If you're a leader and you come into a position, you walk into this is your team and you didn't make it, you know, and a lot of times you don't have the, the, the authority to change it without creating a lot of disruption. And disruption is you make everybody feel insecure, you make everybody get defensive, you make everybody start covering their ass and keeping their heads down and not taking risks and everything. And you don't want that. And that's behavior that people will default into. They're very used to, to protecting themselves. A lot of energy, a huge amount of energy goes into people protecting themselves, just trying to look good, trying to make other people think they're, they're competent, trying to cover up their mistakes or cover up their weaknesses. So ultimately, you, you want to create a dynamic where people feel liberated from that and they feel like they can get down to the work, you know, and if you if you just start changing people, you create a lot of barriers to getting people to open up. Sometimes, sometimes you have to make changes. And that's part of this, one of the very hard parts of a leader's job. And I think you have to take that responsibility very seriously. But for me, that's a last resort. I want to, I want to explore. I want to keep on challenging myself to see if I can, if I can help this team to work better, forgive that my telephone. I'm getting constant calls from Lithuania. I don't know. How to, I don't know. That's how to, okay. And they hang up. They don't even talk to me. <laughs> that is okay. So, what would you say is the most difficult thing for you as a leader? or for any leader? What is the most difficult part of leadership? Well, of course, there, there are many things that are difficult. Uh, and it's, it's difficult for me to think of, you know, what's the most difficult thing. But I, I, one thing comes to mind, 
And I'd call it, you know, keeping your eyes on the prize. By which I mean that any endeavor is going to have, any worthwhile endeavor is going to have a lot of discouragement in it. There are going to be things that you try that are not going to go the way that you want to. There are, you're going to want to connect up with people and you can't connect with them. You're going to get responses from people that are not what you want to hear. There's going to be discouragement. You're going to be limited by your own uh, limited ability and limited resources. And so there's a lot of discouragement. But as a leader, it's incumbent upon you to not get discouraged because it's not only for yourself. You, you're you representing the whole team. And if you get discouraged, then the team is going to get discouraged. And, and, and so I think that... There are momentary discouragements, but as a leader, one of your great capabilities is you have to be resilient and you have to be able to once again find that scent, that thing that attracted you. You, know, you lose the scent for a while, but you have to find it again and, uh, and then pursue it. And you have to find a way to, to get yourself re-energized because without your energy, the team will sag as well. And I find that challenging because if you're doing something worthwhile, that means that there's going to be more discouragement. If you don't try anything, you don't suffer that kind of discouragement. When you're trying something that's, especially if it's something new, the, the new adventure, adventures, the creative ideas, the, the innovations and all that, you have to work 10 times harder to get accepted oh, yeah. than them. So I think a leader has to understand that, that that's your opponent is conventional wisdom and inertia, and you have to be able to rebound from the inevitable discouragements. Yeah, I agree 110%. Definitely true. So let's talk about one last thing, organizational agility. Oh, yeah. Tell us about that. Well, it's really important in today's world. Um, organizational agility is important because if, let's say you have a success model, you have a, a business model and it's working really great and, you know, you keep on, you scale it and you get, you know, get lots of success and, and everything's going great. You know, in a, in a static world, that's, that you're golden, you've got it made. But we live in a very dynamic world. And the fact is that what was successful at one time is no longer going to be successful. If you're in the business of making typewriters and you make the best typewriters and, and, and you know, you're doing great, there's going to kind of time where the typewriter is a relic the way it is in our time. You know, hardly anybody uses typewriters anymore. It, it, it's a thing of the past, and everything will become a thing of the past. And therefore, you have to have a sense of in which direction the world is moving and how, how that movement is going to influence what it is that you're doing and how you can take the things that, that you do and make them relevant for where the world is, is going to go. And because it moves so rapidly now, uh, I mean, especially like with artificial intelligence, there's going to be so much displacement. There's going to be so much disruption and industries, big industries are going to die, you know, almost overnight because things are going to change so fast. So if you don't have organizational agility, you're not going to be able to survive. And there's another thing. Let's say your leadership of your organization is brilliant and, and they have had a clear, a very clear vision about what needs to be done in order to be relevant in the coming, coming time. And they announce it to the workforce. That doesn't mean the workforce is going to do it. Most of the time, the workforce will resist it. Because people like to stay with the things that feel good, that are successful, and they don't like to, to venture into the uncertain and the unknown. Uh, so organizational agility is both the, the ability to see clearly 
uh, have this sense of where things are going because it's always a guess. Nobody knows for sure. Um, and then to be able to mobilize people and get buy-in and get enrollment of your workforce to follow you into that strategy, to follow you into the somewhat unknown. I like that. That that is amazing. All right. So, if there was one thing, I'm having trouble connecting to the internet. Okay. Take a look at the help section. <laughs> Sorry about that. If there was one thing that you could take. Or, sorry, if there was one thing that you could give our audience to take with them through 2019, to carry them through this year, what would it be? One thing. If I could wish something for your audience, and just one thing, it would be believe in yourself. Uh, And it's not a, a simple thing that to believe in yourself. It, like somebody might say, "Well, I'm great, and I know I'm great, and I believe in that." I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about with regard to the the uh, challenges. I mean, I think living life is an uphill struggle. You, it's not downhill; it's uphill. Uh, and and sometimes one wishes for a, a downhill. One wishes for a level playing field, you know, or a level, you know, where things aren't stacked against you. But a lot of times, in many ways, there are challenges. There are interpersonal challenges and relationship challenges, and then there are there are professional challenges, and there are, you know, uh, there is just this full of challenges. And if you understand that life is challenging and in your heart you know that you have something to offer and that if, if you can only figure out how to, how to build a bridge between what it is that you have to offer and what it is that the world needs and you have to build a bridge on both sides. It can't be just this is what I have to offer and, and therefore the world should accept it. You have to know enough about the world to figure out what is it that what does the world need and how do I build a bridge between what I have to offer and that. That just believe in that and have faith in that and don't lose your your um uh I wouldn't call it optimism, but don't lose your energy and don't lose this feeling that you can make a difference, that you can make a difference in a positive way and you can help to make life better for people. Don't lose that when you get challenged. That's a little bit like keeping your eyes on the prize. It's, it's close to that. But that's if you ask me to have one thing that I would give, that I would wish, that's what comes to mind for me. That is amazing. Well, guys, there you have it. Lots of nuggets in this interview. Mr. Nirenberg, thank you so much for sharing all of this wisdom with us. This is one of the most powerful interviews that I have ever had. I have learned so much, and I'm sure that everyone listening will learn so much from you as well. 